Okay, so me again. <laughs> I um, am going to talk about clinical informatics now, um, which is a topic I am more, more what I do every day. Um, so I'm a, I'm a physician. So I, I split my time half here in the School of Biomedical Informatics, and the other half I spend um, in the operating room taking care of patients as an anesthesiologist. So um, that's really what clinical informatics is, is, is bridging that gap. So bringing those two, two worlds together, and um, that's what I'm gonna talk about here. My background for how I got into that actually is, is I started off as a, as a geographer. <laughs> <laughs> I went to grad school in geography. I have a master's in geography from the University of Oregon. And um, through that, I got interested in data and data visualization because I was interested in climate science, which is another field that has incredible amounts of data that's hard to understand and very noisy. And, and in many ways, it's actually similar to, um, or there's some similarities to medical data in those respects. So I had to learn how to be a programmer and Fortran 77 and all that <laughs> stuff to, 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 to write my masters. And at any rate, um, I, uh, I also worked for a couple years in a, as a software developer for um, a uh, small startup company. So then I went to medical school and, and I, I came back to bi bi biomedical informatics because I was so struck when I started using EHRs by how hard they were to use. And to me, when I look at an EHR, what I see is the database schema underlying it because I could have written it. I mean, and I see all the shortcuts that I would have taken as sloppy stuff that I would have done to just to kind of get the job done. And that's actually why I came back um, to informatics, because I wanted to address those problems. I wanted to solve that, bring, to, bring together my knowledge of computer science, development, IT, with my, with my clinical knowledge. So that's really what um, clinical informatics is. And so what I'm going to do here is walk you through a, um, a bit of an ex exercise in defining it because that's been a topic of interest in the last five to 10 years, is, is kind of figuring out what is clinical informatics and how it fits within the larger um, scheme of biomedical informatics. So I'll walk you through that. Um, the AMIA def definition, AMIA is the American uh, Medical Informatics Association. It's sort of the professional home for biomedical informatics, uh, broadly defined, so clinical informatics is one subset of that. Um, clinical informatics, although I'm going to focus on the definition that's been emerging in the last, say, 10 years, um, this is not new. People have been trying to use, doctors have been trying to use computers to solve medical problems since the era of the vacuum tube, the 40s and 50s. There were people out there trying to use computers usefully in medicine, um, sometimes quite successfully, even in the 50s and 60s. Um, but it wasn't until you know the internet and use you know graphical user interfaces and now mobile devices have you know I personally carry two or three computers with me at all times you know my iPad my my laptop my phone you know it's incredible how much computing power we each have with us so that's that's what's really changed in recent years so I don't I don't want to pretend that this is a new thing because it's not but I will just talk about the sort of recent definition. So here's a big overview, taking a step back, of biomedical informatics and the definition that you'll get if you go to the AMIA website. Um, this is published in uh, JAMIA. And on the vertical axis is a spectrum of interests, issues ranging from basic research at the top down to applied research and practice. And then on the, the x-axis is a range of sort of scale from molecules, cells, tissues, organs, all the way over to patients and populations. So you can map out all the different subspecialties of biomedical informatics in here, and you'll see where clinical informatics sits, which is on the end of the spectrum that's oriented around applied issues and practice and patients and populations. That's where we sit. So if you go to the website and read, they have a whole page on what is clinical informatics. So uh, the way they define it is that it's the application of informatics and information technology to deliver healthcare services. So this applies to all informatics professionals who are involved in the delivery of healthcare services. So as we try to build our definition here, key concept has something to do with information technology and something to do with delivery of healthcare services. And they go on to say that um, clinical informatics is kind of irrelevant of what your actual degree is or what your specialty is. So 
It is um, the same practice of applying informatics processes to deliver healthcare services, whether you're a dentist, a doctor, a pharmacist, a nurse, an emergency medical technician, they don't, AMIA tries to, you know, be inclusive on this front. Now, whether or not they've been successful with that is another matter, and this is a little bit of a political issue within the organization. But um, at its core, it's um, concerned with information use by healthcare workers, by clinicians who are actually delivering it. So, again, our definition, we want to be broad here, and I think that is actually very important in supporting this field, is to be broad. I am a doctor, so I bring that bias with me, and I I'm trying to be inclusive in it, but my perspective and what I practice is as a physician, and I will always be a physician. But it is really important to collaborate with everyone and be inclusive with everyone. So that's really a, a key point that I want to make about uh, clinical informatics. It is not just a medical specialty, although I'm going to talk about that. It is a specialty for nurses. Um, it is a specialty for respiratory therapists. Anyone who practices medicine on any level who is also an informatician is practicing clinical informatics and should be supported in doing that because they bring a different level of expertise to the field. So it is a very broad topic, um, ranging from things like the use of clinical decision support, that's um, using logic rules at the point of care in an EHR to guide treatment, um, to interpretation of visual images, things like x-rays, uh, pathology slides, um, dermatological images. I mean, I, I, my sister's a dermatologist. I text her pictures <laughs> of rashes on my kids all the time. I, we do, we do tele, um, teledermatology all the time. Same thing with ophthalmology, looking at the, um, the, the images of the eye. Um, these are all interpretive tasks which have a computable component to them. Um, clinical documentation as we've gone electronic uh, is a big, big topic. Physician order entry, also a huge topic in the field and how the, the, that, the impact of changing the workflow around writing an order, what you want a patient to receive, to actually entering it into a computer has been huge. Um, and then there's the system design. What should the EHR look like? How should it function? to its implementation, how do we actually build this out and make sure we have a computer in the right place so that it can actually be used effectively at the bedside, and then adoption. How do we get my colleagues to use this thing now that we've spent half a billion dollars on it? So again, back to our definition here, the delivery of healthcare service, pulling in those, those general points, clinical decision support, images, documentation, order, and then the system design, implementation, and adoption. So uh, back in 2005, AMIA started this process of trying to convince or, or investigate and then convince the American Board of Medical Specialties whether or not clinical informatics should be a physician subspecialty of medicine. And uh, they started that in 2005, and this was the, their findings, which were published in uh, 2009. This is a white paper from AMIA about the core content for the subspecialty of clinical informatics. And what has happened since then, 2011, I believe, the American Board of Medical Specialties agreed. They said this is a subspecialty of medicine. And then they took it to um, all the different member boards of the American Board of Medical Specialties and said, would you guys recognize someone who has been, you know, passed the, a board exam in clinical informatics? Would you accept that as a subspecialty of medicine, anesthesiology, surgery, whatever? Everyone agreed. So the first exam was actually last year. I took it. I passed. Hooray. So I'm actually a board certified physician in clinical informatics. I'm part of the first group. There are, I think, 450 or so um, physicians who actually took and passed the exam. Um, and this is actually a very new and different model that's never been applied before. There, it's never happened before where every specialty of medicine agreed to recognize the same subspecialty. That's never happened before. So this is kind of, this is, it's, it's a really new thing. And it came out of this effort from AMIA and um, this particular paper. Um, so what they publish in here is the core content. I'm kind of using as the, the boundaries for what clinical informatics is, again, I have to warn you, this is my bias as a physician, but I think it applies a across the board. The emphasis that has gone on to making physicians board certified has become political, and because uh, it's not inclusive. You have to be a doctor, you have to be board certified in something else to actually qualify for this. And so it, it's, it's been, again, a social problem within the, the field because some people feel left out. 
Anyway, um, so in this paper, they go on to talk about what clinical informa informaticians do, and they paint it as this transformative specialty that cuts across all of medicine with, um, that is involved in information technology and communication systems and enhances individual and population health outcomes, improves patient care, and strengthens the clinician-patient relationship. So that's the definition that comes out of that white paper that went on and actually led to the creation of a new medical specialty. So I'm sticking that in the bottom of my, dish, of my definition here. So at its core, this field um, posits that there is value in combining your skills as a physician with your knowledge of information science. That's, that's the value that's added by creating this, this new thing. So what you should do with that information is you're in a unique position to assess what the information needs are in your specialty, whether it's for a physician or an, or an anesthesiologist or a nurse that is also trying to analyze what the information needs are at the, at the bedside as they're taking care of a patient in the ICU. Um, you're also in a position where you can help refine the clinical processes that go around delivery of healthcare and how it intersects with, um, with uh, the electronic medical record. Um, and by doing that, you can help develop, implement, and refine clinical decision support systems because you understand how this piece of technology is being used at the bedside. You're a consumer of it, but you also know the limitations of what is a computable problem What's the kind of thing that we can do? How can we put a set of logical rules that are informed by clinical medicine into a computer system that will actually function um, in the intended way and actually improve the way we deliver healthcare? And then there's a, there's a component here that they identified as leadership. So you're, these are not small tasks to get accomplished. You have to be able to affect change in a large organization with a large number of people. So leadership skills are actually a very important component of this around the procurement, evaluation, and improvement of health information systems. So if you're going to be an informatician, you can assess information needs, clinical process, clinical decision support, and provide leadership. That's, that's the core of what you do when you're actually doing this job. You're at the intersection of the fields here. So somewhere you bring together your clinical care, the health system, and IT. Um, and really what you're trying to do in, in, in so doing is promote uh, patient care that is safe, efficient, effective, timely, patient-centered, and equitable. Those are not things that most um, physicians would attribute to their IT department in their hospital. So again, it's trying to build the bridge between those worlds where you, you understand both sides of the process and can actually lead. Um, you have to have medical knowledge to be board certified. In my case, you have to be board, I have to be board certified in anesthesiology to maintain my board certification in clinical informatics, but that's also true of a nurse at the, at the bedside. They need to be a nurse too. They need to be actually in the trenches delivering um, medical care and have all that knowledge. You have to know what you're doing around informatics. Uh, business processes is actually a very, very important part of this specialty. So in supporting that from, an, from a library science point of view, understanding the business literature about what makes people change their behavior, how, what are the economics around particular, that's actually a very, very important part of this. Um, how people make decisions, evidence-based medicine is very important. How do you re-engineer processes so that they work better? Again, it's that kind of change management stuff. Um, and then the fundamental concepts uh, and how to evaluate, and I, I keep talking about the leadership component here. Okay, so how do you support this new um, medical specialty? We have our definition here. Let's go down um, some of the things that, that might come up um, in, as, as librarians. Um, you know, clinical informaticist comes to you with a problem. How can you support them in each of these areas? So, Information technology is a core part of this. You have to understand how, how um, information systems work. You have to understand some com basic computer science principles. So things like algorithms, applications, user interfaces, um, application program interfaces or APIs, um, the details of storage systems, the details of networks and security and database structures, those are all topics that fall within the specialty. So you have to have some expertise in that and you need to support people 
um, trying to answer those kinds of questions. Um, delivery of healthcare services as well. Um, human factors is a huge part of this. So it's not just about how the computer system works, but what are the human computer interactions that lead to effective use of that computing system or ineffective? What leads to increased error? How do we decrease errors? There's a huge literature out there on um, human factors, which uh, you know, sadly has, was probably not addressed early enough in our push to adopt electronic medical records, and that's why we've had problems in implementing them, because there was not adequate consideration of the human factors that go into using systems like this. There's a cognitive science part of that. That's a big part of what we do here. Um, Industrial engineering, the literature around that is also very important. Um, there's talk now, we're, we're in the process of purchasing a, an anesthesia electronic medical record because we're actually still on paper. But um, as we move forward with that, with that process, we're gonna hire, one of the big private practices in town wants to hire out of their own pocket, not the hospital paying for it, the practice paying for it, to have an industrial engineer come and to make sure that we get the processes around how we're going to roll this out right so that it actually serves the, 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 the purpose of the end. Um, the business process, again, very important. Medical legal issues, you have to be knowledgeable about what's required in a clinical note if you're going to be the one designing the template for it. So you have to understand medical legally what's, what's important to put in there. And then the administrative issues, again, are huge. Um, information use by all uh, types of clinicians. This is, again, the needs assessment. What kind of information does an individual who's taking care of a patient in a particular context need? As a, as a clinician and an informatician, you bring that context to the, the table. Um, you understand the communication problems that, that, that practitioners struggle with. You have the domain knowledge in each domain. Um, so in my case, uh, as a physician or it could be a nurse. Um, specialty expertise, I can provide specialty input on anesthesia related issues because I'm an anesthesiologist. So we need um, specialty references, we need specialty education. When you look at some of the health IT interventions that have been made in anesthesiology, they're actually not published in the, bio, in the um, biomedical informatics literature. There's a lot of it that was also published in the anesthesia literature because you're trying to solve that applied component, you're solving an anesthesia problem. So really the whole domain of specialty medical journals is fair game for trying to support this process because you're in the, um, the clinical space and you're trying to deliver healthcare services. So that's anesthesiology, that's um, anesthesia and analgesia in, in my world. There's, there's a lot of papers that are published in those journals that relate directly to these kinds of um, informatics issues. And then there's the healthcare transformation. Um, this is where we bring in, again, a very broad spectrum of resources that you need to keep up with. So outcomes research, um, public health, uh, safety and quality is a big part of the, the clinical informatics curriculum. And again, taking a leadership role in that. How can we use information about the way we're taking care of patients to improve outcomes, improve safety? Um, how do we use those things to improve our patient engagement? So mobile technology is a big part of that. Self-tracking, I don't know if anybody here, anybody here a self-tracker? Got a Fitbit on there? I lost my Fitbit, unfortunately. Ah, look at that. So how do, how do you use those tools to engage with your doctor when you tell them how many steps you're taking a day and what your weight has, how it's fluctuated, home blood pressure monitoring, all that kind of stuff um, is, we hope, gonna be transformative in improving our outcomes and saving money and, and, and providing better care. Um, another aspect of this too is uh, physician education and patient education, that sort of point of care. I'm at the bedside, I need to look something up, up to date. Um, uh, other sort of clinical databases that we use when you're, when you got your phone and you're in the hospital trying to figure out how to take care of a difficult problem. That's another thing that uh, is relevant that needs to be supported. So um, here's a little clinical vignette. Again, I'm, I'm focused here on clinical informatics as a practice of medicine. So if you were uh, a doctor and you're admitting an internist and you're, you get called to admit a patient to the hospital, a 78-year-old um, patient who's in the ER who has GI bleed, you're going to admit them. And you probably, if it's at all complicated, you're gonna call a gastroenterologist because that's their medical specialty. You need expert advice on how to deal with this 
medical problem. You've identified what it is. If it's a complicated patient, you might not know all the reasons that are going into why it's occurring, and you need a little bit of it. You need expert consultation. So when the gastroenterologist comes and evaluates the patient, they can provide diagnostic expertise. You may have a pretty good idea why they're bleeding, but they can they can provide a little bit more um, diagnostic information if it's at all not clear why why they're having the problem they're having. They can also provide um, expertise in how to manage it. If the patient needs a procedure to address the problem to either improve their the diagnosis or um, improve management, they can perform it. So a colonoscopy, not any physician can perform a colonoscopy, only gastroenterologists are credentialed to do that. So you need expert advice to help you take care of the patient. The other thing you get is follow-up care. So um, you can ask, you know, this patient with a GI bleed, are they getting better afterwards? The, the gastroenterologist is going to follow and make sure that they stay on that course. They're the expert in dealing with this patient. So here's, here's the kind of parallel. <laughs> for the practice of clinical informatics. You have a 78-year-old patient with abdominal pain who gets ordered 10 milligrams of hydromorphone in the hospital. Physician and pharmacy do not detect the error. The nurse at the bedside refuses to administer it because says, this is crazy. So hydromorphone is a powerful um, uh, nar synthetic narcotic. It's about five times more potent than morphine. So this would be the equivalent of giving 50 milligrams of morphine to an elderly patient would probably be, you know, that, that'd be an overdose. They would at least need to be intubated, um, go to the ICU, or they would, you know, not make it. That, that is potentially fatal error that could be made. So this example kind of comes from <laughs> the world of the paper record. So here, here's a, a shot. You see that Dilaudid is the, is the brand name for hydromorphone. Uh, 10 milligrams is probably supposed to be 1.0. So 1 milligram? These kinds of errors happen all the time in the hospital. Um, and in fact, we've had similar issues with this in the last couple of years that I personally am familiar with. And um, there's a lot of interest in having our information systems catch this kind of stuff. So we do dose range checking at the time that the order is placed. There are different places where that can be implemented. It can be implemented by the at the time the order is placed. It can be implemented, implemented in the pharmacy when the pharmacist signs off and says yes, confirms the order. And then it can also be caught at the, at the time that the dose is being administered before you give it. So we, you, there are different ways to implement that um, particular rule. Um, in this case, you know, I'm sort of making this up that the, the physician and pharmacy didn't detect the error. Now, there are reasons why that could happen even in our current electronic systems. We actually don't have dose range checking turned on in many places in the hospital. So for an anesthesiologist, I might actually be comfortable giving 10 milligrams of the lot to the patient. My personal record is like 100. Um, but that patient was an outlier, really, really needed it. There are times in somebody's hospital care where you might want that alert turned off, so that could happen. Same thing in the pharmacy, things could slip through. So this is kind of a made up case, but um, it's not that far off from the truth. So what could you do to, to, to keep it from happening again? Well, this is where we hope that clinical informatics as a specialty of medicine could step in and provide some expert consultation. So they could analyze the system of information that flow and figure out, well, why didn't we catch this? This is a gross error. We should have caught this one. Why didn't it get caught? They can do that analysis. Um, the management, how can they prevent, how can we prevent this from happening again? And then in terms of like a, the analogy to a specialty procedure would be how do we implement a new clinical decision support rule in our EHR that will catch us in the future? And then the critical part here is also follow-up to make sure that if you do implement that new rule, did it work? Is it actually functioning as intended? Do people find a workaround to bypass it so they don't have to look at it? Or do they just hit ignore every time the alert fires? You want to make sure it's an effective, um, uh, an effective intervention. And if it's not effective, then you need to go back and continue to modify it. So um, there are a couple of institutions, academic institutions, that actually do um, offer clinical informatics uh, consult services. This is at Vanderbilt. It's not quite what I described. Um, this is, and I actually talked with um, someone from Vanderbilt about this. He actually didn't know that it existed, so 
that's a little bit of a problem. But this is a new, this is a new thing. Um, these are, you know, you have a very difficult patient in the ICU that you really don't know what to do with them. So you can call a consult and they'll actually help with a literature search. They might suggest some testing based on what they find in the literature. That's the kind of consult that, that, that they're talking about here, not really what I described. Um, and then the, the other people that offer this as a true consult service is Stanford. Um, and they offer it more in terms of re developing a research question and a research protocol. So they'll provide an in-person consultation. Kind of be the person who does the, analyst, the analysis of the clinical data warehouse to say, yes, you can do your research study as you have envisioned it, or no, you, you, you just don't have enough patients. That's the kind of thing. And I will leave you on this, what clinical informatics is <laughs> not. That raises the question, so